Hi everybody. Welcome to Facebook Live. It's my first Facebook Live. I'm so excited that you're with me and I hope you'll enjoy today's journal techniques demonstration. Today I'm excited to talk to you about journals, some of the techniques that I've learned. I'll talk about journals in general, the ones that I use with heavy watercolor paper. We'll talk about acrylic techniques that go with those journals and create some of the textures that allow layering and covering mistakes and so on and so forth. Also, we'll, we'll be working with certain brushes, the Skoda brushes and Princeton brushes, which are a couple of my favorites. And then finally, we'll be working with a product called Artgraph. And so stay tuned for those techniques. However, I think it might be a little bit important for me to tell you a little bit about who I am. I really always said I'd rather be lucky than good. And Sometimes you get lucky. Uh, I got a phone call and was asked to be one of the co-editors of the 100th anniversary of the Speedball textbook. This was in 2015. One of the highlights of a lettering career is to be able to work with not only the history of the Speedball pen and how it came about, but also with calligraphers and lettering artists across the country. My education began in the mid-1990s. I was fortunate enough to find one of the only certificate programs. It was a two-year program at Cerritos College in calligraphy. It was taught by Marsha Brady. Her husband, Larry Brady, had developed the program and was a professor, longtime professor of graphic design at Long Beach State. Some of the student work that was put out was phenomenal in Marsha's class. This is some of my student work from that time. There, and there were quite a few wonderful calligraphers that came out of there, including my friend Barbara Close, who will be doing one of the first Sandia Workshops online classes called Pointed Pen Possibilities. I would uh, highly encourage you to check that out at Sandia Workshops. For me, I was gravitating towards wanting to mix image and word. And I had wanted to paint, and I wanted to paint on canvas. This rendering of the poem from the Million Man March by Maya Angelou was one of the first pieces that I ever did that integrated both calligraphy and painting in a way that was more natural than separate illustrations. That led to the first painting that I would call a painting in my style. This is called Family Blessings. It's a collection of quotes and scriptures. And the painting itself was three feet by five feet wide, to give you an idea. Uh, I had worked on prime canvas, and the first two or three paintings I did were working on prime canvas and trying to figure out how to use acrylics and lettering on a slick surface like prime canvas. I wanted to gravitate actually towards unprimed canvas, and so this painting called L'Esprit was done uh, it was about the fourth painting I did, and I was experimenting with raw canvas and then sealing the canvas as I went, both with paints and mediums. That led me to probably the breakthrough in my techniques working with this painting called Inviting the Presence. As a close-up will show in an area up here in the white space where there's texture. And all of these textures are what I was working towards and all of the techniques that I was learning. About the same time, I got a random phone call from a producer who was putting the original Pirates of the Caribbean onto DVD. They were working on special features and they needed a pirate, Black Bart in particular, in prison writing memoirs for one particular section of the special features that was being narrated by a historian. They told me that they would send me the paper and they would provide the pens and I said, yeah, no thanks, I'll just go ahead and do my own tests. And so this is when I was introduced to the handmade papers of the journal. These particular journals were called Handmade and they were pr uh, produced by Global Art. And so I sent samples and well, I got the job. Uh, I was the pirate writing in there. My hand was the star. There actually was a little cameo of my face in one of the intros. And so I became a star with my then teenage daughter and all her friends for about a day and a half. But what happened is that I was working with these papers. I had stained them with tea. I had stained them with coffee. And I began to realize that the techniques that I was working with on canvas worked also on these papers. I began to, to work with the papers on a regular basis. I would 
uh, meet with a group of men and take these journals with me and sort of take notes as we talked about things over coffee in the morning over an hour and then I'd come back and paint with them and work with them on all of these techniques and eventually began to explore different ways to use these textures in order to create ancient looking pages. In this particular case, I was working with an ancient Phoenician and Greek alphabet and then creating my own alphabets with those alphabets as a starting point. And obviously these techniques worked throughout for the textures in the background. I began to work also with a friend who is a poet and work with these journal techniques in formal artwork. Chris Barron is a poet from San Diego. He, in this particular case, was writing a poem about the Holocaust. And so I was working with all these textures and then pacing and beginning to work with how a viewer would experience his poetry in a different way than just a stanza format, but in a visual format. He also wrote poetry about sitting at his grandmother's table as a kid and listening to her stories coming from the old country and asking her questions about his identity in America. Naturally, as I continued with these journals, I began to stack up a whole bunch of journals and use different journals. I had originally found the global journals, which were the brown covers, but then I found the uh, Nujabi journals, which were at the time in the early 2000s being sold by ASW Express Online. They were 50 pages. They were 11 by 15 which opened means a half sheet of watercolor paper, and they had a soft press watercolor paper. They were great journals. I actually started teaching classes and then they suddenly started to be unavailable and on back order. When I called them, they said they were no longer going to import them. And so I began to design my own journals. I had had enough time to have feedback. The original journals were 50 pages and very heavy. So I designed these journals with the same soft watercolor paper with 30 pages, I had a cloth binding instead of a paper binding, and the import was done by Paper and Ink Arts of Nashville, Tennessee, one of our calligraphy suppliers. They're wonderful journals. They're 11 by 15, which means open. They're 22 by 15, which is roughly the size of a half sheet of watercolor paper. Um, and then they have hand-sized paper, which is a joy for me to work on because of the unpredictability. So if you haven't worked on such a journal, it's a pleasure and I would encourage you to try one out. Of course, there's other journals. Uh, the Handbook Journal Company makes beautiful travel journals with sized watercolor paper, a little bit lighter, and they're great for uh, watercolor and sketching. There are a variety of spiral bound either sketchbooks or watercolor journals that people like to use because they lay flat, both Stillman and Byrne and the Handbook Paper Company have these journals. And I like to work in these journals, but the paper in the journals is machine sized, which means it's very consistent, which most people really look for consistency in a journal. I, however, love the handmade papers because of the lack of consistency. So that'll give you a little bit of an introduction. And then let's talk about some of these journals that I work with now. Now, I think uh, what we'll do is thank you for being patient with me through that introduction. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and we'll go to take a look at some of the journals that I work with. Um, so you can get a sense of scale. My hands here are on the journals and uh, sewing books together. And so when I, when I got an 11 by 15 journal, I didn't have to sew anymore. Uh, so let's flip through some of these. This is my teaching journal. And let's go ahead and flip through this. First thing that you'll see is that what I do with these journals and is a lot of experiments. These are my teaching journals. And so in this particular case, I've done quite a few images of my grandson in different manners. So one is with no preparation and just layering pigments. And the other is with a little bit of mediums uh, included with the paints for uh, different effects. Um, I quite often go with the highlights. Um, as I continue through the journals, I've done quite a few studies with color wheels. Uh, the color wheels can be done with a double primary palette or a regular primary palette. And these studies are studies that 
tell me the difference between mineral pigments and modern pigments? In this particular case, what I've done is I've prepared the bottom part of the wheel with matte medium and uh, am looking at the absorption rates on the matte medium versus where there's no matte medium and how these pigments absorb into the paper and the top part of the color, color wheel with uh, no, nothing so that it soaks in more. Um, in this particular case, here's the mineral versus modern page. In the upper left hand corner are the mineral pigments, which are ground from naturally occurring inorganic materials. Uh, the bottom pages are these synthetic pigments, and you really can tell the difference between these synthetic pigments and the mineral pigments by the greens. The greens in the synthetic pigments are much more vibrant. So depending on what you are looking for in your painting will depend on what you might want to do with the mineral or modern pigments. Uh, and again, I will also prep the pages just a little bit so you can see on the right-hand color wheel a difference in absorption rates. Uh, then as we go and get into just the journal techniques, very often I'll use these journals as notes in classes. In this particular case, I was taking a class from my friend Georgia Angelopoulos. She was working with Cyrillic letters, and so I just started to write Cyrillic letters. Later I came in, and many times weeks or months later, I will come in and take those Cyrillic letters and then layer other things over them, put washes over them, uh, write over them, and use gesso to begin to create designs. So these really come over a period of time, not just one sitting. If you're just learning calligraphy, for example, um, one of the tips might be you can practice in these journals. You can practice your lettering all the time because later, as we layer, we can cover those things up. One of the caveats is if you're practicing, it's good to practice with a waterproof um, uh, based either ink or felt pen, something that's not necessarily going to run. Um, you can use things like walnut ink and they will run and that's fine as long as you know they're going to do that. But I always try to make sure that I know when I'm using a um, waterproof ink versus a water soluble ink. So as we flip through these, you'll see that the techniques for textures that I've talked about before, for example, this Cyrillic writing was written with a China marker and it resists when I paint over it. And so it will show through later. That was written white on white. But you'll also see different areas where I've treated the paper quite a bit differently. So the area right here is where matte medium has been put down and washed over and the matte medium resists absorption versus the paint soaking in. You'll also see, again, the Cyrillic writing that I've taken uh, circles and I've used gesso just to kind of create designs and cover over some of those things in order to put them in the background and make them textural. I'll practice brush lettering and anything. This page is a page that was a demo page that became quite ugly, but I can fix that later. This page also had different textures and, and over time I've added different textures to it and different colors in order to work with the page textures. Now, because of the way that I work, I may take a look at a page later and say, well, I don't like this page, I wanna tint this page. And so very often I will take paint, uh, very watered down paint and mix the paint directly onto the page. So in this particular case, I'm going to get a brush wet and I've just brushed water onto this page and you can see actually that it's absorbing in the places where there's no matte medium. Um, now in the absence of um, uh, working with a palette, I'm working with Golden's uh, fluid acrylic and I'm just going to get a little dab on my brush. Uh, dip that dab in water and as I put a wash over it instead of making colors on a palette and mixing on a palette I'm now mixing the colors or tinting the page in layers so in this particular case what I'm doing is I'm adding a very watered brush with some pigment on it pigments on the top but the water's on the bottom 
and all I'm doing is tinting these areas. When I was a kid, my brother and I would get in trouble. And the difference between my brother and I is that they'd say, hey, you have to be in your room for two hours. And so I'd go into my room for two hours, and my brother would be in there for two hours, and every 15 or 20 minutes he'd open the door and say, is it time to go yet? Is it time to go? And with me, at the end of two hours, they'd open the door and say, okay, you're not in trouble anymore. You can come out of your room. And I'd be like, okay, hey, I'm still coloring. I'll be out in 20 minutes. So this, to me, is that root of coloring. And still to this day, I really appreciate that process. I can get kind of lost in that process. If I get too much paint on the, on the uh, page like that, I'll just add a little bit more water and move the paint around and, and just keep coloring. And so very quickly, I've pretty much changed the character of this page just by adding some of these colors, watering them down, and... Um, uh, working with tints. I can even take away some of the color. So I'm going across the gesso if I really want to enhance the contrast. Um, when I have wet pigment, I can take a paper towel and take that pigment away. Now the techniques that I'm using in this process are very simple watercolor washes. They're almost dirty water watercolor washes. I'm not painting thick. One of the other problems with painting thick is that if I was painting thick on these pages, then pretty soon I'd have a book that wouldn't be able to close because of the uh, abundance of acrylic paint that comes out of the, that, that would be laying on top of the page. So as we move on, you can see that over time, this was a class demo that's become really ugly. I'll fix it with some gesso or something else, but there are a bunch of textures created. So it doesn't really matter if I've done some letters that I'm not really happy with because they just become a part of the overall texture. I, I do have a page here where I can demonstrate this technique. This is probably one of the most important techniques that I've done. So I usually, um, many of you are painters, many of you might use a palette knife. I've found that uh, credit cards or room keys or old, uh, some type of plastic cards are just as good as palette knives. So in the interests of time, I'm just going to put uh, a little bit of uh, golden matte medium onto the side of that credit card. For those of you who are not sure what matte medium is, matte medium is a basically clear paint. Gloss medium is the base for all of the pigments. And if they want it not so shiny, they will put matting agents in it. So matte medium is something that you could literally mix with powdered pigments and create your own acrylic paint. So matte medium, because it's clear, will allow me to see what's underneath. For example, on this side of the page, you see that I've got an ABC. It was written in a, with a marker called a Sakura uh, calligrapher, Pigma calligrapher marker. Uh, it's a permanent marker. So when I go over it with this matte medium, you should see that there's nothing is really gonna happen to it. And so I'm literally putting clear paint on the side of the page. The flatter I hold the card, the more ragged of an edge I get. The more upright I hold a card, the cleaner edge that I'll get. So depending on what type of technique you want will depend on how flat or upright you hold the card. Now this page uh, I've just done and so it's wet. However, the page on the other side uh, I did previously. And so again, here's that same A and B that was done with a, with the, with a marker. And I'm going to go ahead and use this red paint and get a little bit on my brush, uh, get a lot of water on it. And so I've got a really thin sort of red paint and I'm using a small brush to work with this. But what you should see is as I continue to work with the brush, you should see areas where that clear paint is now resisting the paint that I'm putting on the page. So um, these lighter areas that you see in these ragged edges are clear paint that I've put on. And so it becomes this sort of discovery path of, of yeah, it's, it's almost like you could do secret writing with this, couldn't you? Uh, and so I'm just working with um, the pigments and I'll work with a little bit, little bit larger brush. This is an Escoda, uh, I believe it's a squirrel hair brush. And so I'll, I'll, I'll work with that a little bit longer and if I use thicker pigments, you'll see that I'll get areas where 
uh, those thicker pigments have soaked right into the paper, but when I go over them again with water, um, I can almost take them completely off. So the textures that are seen in, in quite a few of my paintings, this is one of the ways that we'll get those textures. I can also enhance the textures by taking a paper towel and, and literally just kind of, if I wanted to really enhance the contrast, I can take some of that paint right off of there. And now I've got a deep red that's soaked into the watercolor page and a white area that is basically the clear paper showing through the clear acrylic pigment that I've put down. Now this is not necessarily a work of art, is it? It's just uh, showing you some texture. So what will end up happening is at some point in the future, um, I will continue to work with this. Um, I'm literally dipping my brush into the dirty water that has red in it, and, and I can continue to, to just kind of tint the paper as I want. And so this would be an example of a texture that um, uh, on a heavy watercolor paper, and especially a heavy watercolor paper that is hand-sized, it's not uniform, uniformly machine-sized, uh, it can become uh, an important element of whatever your artwork is. Okay. To give you some ideas of how some of this artwork might look, uh, this is the Mahara journal that I had talked about a little bit earlier. Uh, so it's the blue journal. They're about $42. They have 30 pages in them of that soft watercolor paper. This is uh, one of the global art journals. So this is a landscape format uh, global art journal. Now the paper in here is just a bit more rough. Uh, it, so so it's, a, it's a cold press, it's a stiffer paper, it's sized really, really well. And so you can also get some pretty remarkable um, effects. So just what you saw with the original um, clear matte medium putting down for a rough edge texture. So these are some of the same things that I've done here. But let's say that I'm looking at this and I say, okay, I've used some water-based paint here because I see that, it's, that it, uh, this is probably walnut ink that faded out when I went over it with some other paint. That's fine with me. Um, I knew I was doing it and so that was okay. But maybe I don't like, I wanna enhance the color of this page just a little bit. Um, I can either then put my brush in some dirty water and just start to tint with this sort of pink color, or maybe I can get a little bit more paint on my brush and begin to add just a different tint. And maybe I'll add it just here. Or maybe I want a brush stroke that comes out here. Um, and so, so all I'm doing is adding very thin washes of paint onto the page itself and and it changes, it can change the whole character of the page. It just changed the whole character of the page just by adding that red. Um, so again, I could do the same thing here. I'll hold this part up um, so none of you think that I'm, but I can just, I can just come back in and say, yeah, I'll add a little bit of red and I'll, we'll, we'll just tint this page just a bit differently. And so, so there's a different mentality in painting like this in journals, and that mentality is how you mix paint. So many painters, of course, will mix paint on the palette. But when you're using thin washes and glazes uh, and, and you're working with brush strokes, instead of mixing paint on the palette, now what you're doing is you're mixing paint in layers on the page. And so the mentality becomes a little bit different. It becomes a uh, a much more patient mentality. It becomes something that I don't have to finish right now and wait for the paint to dry or, or blending. I'm mixing translucent or transparent layers in order to create a color that's actually on the page. This also is an example of some formal artwork. This is the Mahara journal that we talked about just a little bit earlier. And this um, piece was a spread that I was asked to complete for a magazine called Plow. Plow is a faith-based magazine back east. They were having uh, an issue with an article that was written by the former Archbishop of Canterbury. It was on an ancient document called the Didache, which is one of the oldest living 
Christian documents that's not in the New Testament. And in this particular piece, one of the passages talks about the two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And so the page is divided in these particular sections. And all of these techniques that we've been going over with the map medium and the resist are the techniques that I'm using in this particular case. So the top part is uh, the light part. Um, it starts over at the left with a w lighter and it ends uh, with a much greater division in contrast uh, visually for the viewer. Uh, there's also a square Roman letter form on the left and the rounded uncial letter form on the right. The square Roman was the uh, letter form that they used for traditional Roman literature and the uncial was what was chosen to, to work with the bi biblical texts back in the time of uh, Constantine. Next, I think we'll go ahead and take a look at working with the art graph. In my journey as a renderer, I loved colored pencils. I worked in colored pencils all the time. And, um, you know, I love to do sketching and things like that. Uh, the book that you're looking at right now is this little handbook. Uh, it's a travel journal. It's a, it's a cloth bound book. Um, a little bit smaller than I'm used to, but great for a travel size. This might even be large for a travel size for somebody. Um, if you're a watercolorist or if you are a, um, uh, somebody who travels and sketches a lot, uh, this is a great book. By the way, if you want to look for somebody who's a great uh, watercolor and travel and stretch, ar stretch artists, sketch artists, look up Brenda Swenson on Facebook. Uh, she, she posts all the time with her watercolors. In any case, this is a 240 GSM paper, so it's a nice heavy uh, watercolor paper, not quite as heavy as the 300 GSM papers in the other book, uh, but it takes watercolor really well. And, um, but one of the things I discovered was a product called ArtGraph. An art graph is a water-soluble graphite. This water-soluble graphite um, comes in colors, uh, by the way. So, so here are some cakes. The, if you buy it individually, it comes in little packages. Um, and, but it comes in these cakes, in these, in these cork sort of uh, cork palettes. Uh, and so there's sets. The Earth Tone set, for example, is one that I really like to use. And um, because those colors kind of create my backgrounds. But then um, these sets of either graphite to white uh, or the primary colors also work really well. So I had used uh, these for a painting like this. Um, this is a local um, uh, Santa Fe adobe uh, that's been photographed a million times. I decided to paint it. Um, um, but I wasn't super happy with what was happening here because I was still learning the materials. Uh, but then I decided to paint some peppers and the colors are brilliant. So if you're familiar with colored pencils and you're a renderer in colored pencil, then you know that it's really fun to burnish or create layers in colored pencil and build things up. Well, this just takes it to another level because the graphite's water soluble. So you can actually dip a brush into water and actually come back in and paint these. And so I've come back in and painted these and um, I'm really kind of astonished at the, at the brilliance of the colors. In fact, I'm really happy with the greens. Um, I mean, mixing, normally mixing a blue and a yellow maybe kind of makes a green, uh, but these greens for me turned out sort of brilliantly. So I wanted to I wanted to make sure that I went over that and I wanted to do a very quick demonstration. Um, I won't do a full-blown painting in the time that we have left, uh, which is about three or four minutes, but um, I'm very simply going to take um, uh, an Escoda brush. This is a Modernista Escoda brush um, and I usually use something a little bit larger. And for me, um, I actually like to paint um, the lights first. So, so as I begin, I'm going to work with white and I've already given myself a neutral ground on the page and I'm going to work with this, this white cake of water soluble graphite and I'm going to come in and paint the highlights first. Uh, and so in this particular case, because I've already given myself a 
um, neutral ground, um, I'm, I'm already bringing highlights forward and then I will come back in and later with the other uh, colors to deepen what I'm doing. I always turn uh, my colored photos into grayscale. Uh, it allows me to look at the values of light and dark much better. Uh, the original photograph um, has some of the colors in it that I'll be using. However, it's much easier for me to work with the darks and the lights and then come back in and color the photograph later. So um, because the art graph is water soluble, you may have to come back in and build up the highlights more than once and go over them to get them to the lightest lights. In this particular case, I'm just uh, sort of referencing the photograph and then also referencing where I know that uh, on this neutral ground, the highlights should, should be coming out and where I want to bring them out and enhance them. And so with those layers, uh, I've added some of those layers and I know we're getting to the end of our time here. So let's go ahead and use some reds. Now I'm going to go ahead and paint some of this red on there. It'll probably come on fairly strong initially, but then I'm going to, uh, as with watercolors, I'll put a strong layer down there. I'll dip my brush in water, um, wick the brush off on a paper towel to get most of the moisture out of there. And then I can just pull these reds out as I go, and then it allows me to blend in layers. Uh, and so in this particular quick demo, um, you'll see some raggedness, but as I continue to add water, and that's one of the nice things about the graphite, uh, as well as watercolor, is that it allows me to pull some of these darks out. And so you can already see, um, just with the fact that I'm adding some deeper reds, and then I'm washing them down. The yellows, the ochres that I have on the on the background are already coming through and giving me some of those orange tones uh, that I that I see in the photograph of the flowers that I'm working from. So I'm not really totally working from the photograph of the flowers, uh, but I'm just working again more intuitively. Um, here I am in my room. I got in trouble for something outside, and I'm just coloring again. And so. Uh, whether I'm working with a brush or whether I'm working with some of the um, actual colored pencils, uh, it's the same. It's all the same to me. When you continue to layer, there's, there becomes this sort of waxy finish. There's a, there was a little bit of a shine. I don't know whether you could see it just then, but there's a little bit of a shine that comes off that, and it does have that sort of watercolor finish, or sorry, colored pencil finish to it. Uh, when you're working with these colored pencils. So it's just a different surface. It's not the same as watercolor. It's not soaking into the paper at the same rate, um, although it performs like watercolor, but in layers, you will have a finish that's much more like colored pencil. And so in the interest of time, um, and looking at, looking at the original page, uh, I'm not going to finish this whole thing. I think everybody gets the idea, but the water-soluble graphite, I would highly recommend that you Google Art Graph, A-R-T-G-R-A-F. You will see some amazing videos of, of artists who not only are working perhaps in a more traditional method, um, but they will also work wet into wet. And so if I... Um, Let's see, where's the brush that I'm looking for? There's a brush around here. I just put it down and there it is over there. Uh, and so I'm gonna get a large brush and I'm going to work with a wet area uh, and just that's basically dirty water. Uh, and then I can literally take these cakes and make marks in the water and I'll have that water start to dissipate some of these things. If you're a calligrapher, you could actually work with this and make letters. Uh, but in this particular case, um, drawing with this into wet, you, doing figure work or, or floral work into wet is a beautiful way to work. And again, Google Art Graph and you'll see some amazing artwork. I'm so glad you've joined me today. And what I'm hoping is that perhaps we could get 
a little bit of creativity going. And I also know that there's a lot of you who have these Mahara journals who've never taken the plastic off because you're afraid of them. So go ahead and mess up your Mahara journals, create something, and please be sure there's a link that goes to the Sandia Workshops website page. I'm going to be doing some classes that are online. They're in production right now, writing with a bent nib, which is the speedball nibs. And you can go up and sign up to get more information and an article about the types of lettering that those nibs do. This is the Sandia Workshops webpage for writing with a bent nib, my section of classes. Uh, the classes will appear there. You'll first see an article uh, where you can sign up uh, for the mailing list right here by clicking this. You will automatically get that article. Uh, here are the different classes and styles of lettering that would come with each class section. And again, down at the bottom, uh, you can go ahead and sign up and download this article that was written both by myself and Michael Clark. Thank you for joining us. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.